Hey there, folks. We're all here. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, immersion, a sometimes nebulous concept that uh, everybody wants in their games, but so few seem to be able to find. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to create some, some useful action steps uh, through this conversation, but um, it's definitely going to be a little bit exploratory as well. And speaking of which, John, what would be a good, useful definition of immersion? Um, that's a great question because when I go on like D and D forums, a lot of times I feel like everyone's using the word, but they're using it slightly differently. Um, and so what made me kind of want to talk about this is I've been reading this awesome book called Tabletop Role Playing Therapy by Megan A. Connell, uh, which is specifically talking about game mastering in the frame of uh, therapeutic applied use. Quick disclaimer, that book is written for licensed clinicians. Neither of us are licensed therapists, nor are we uh, advocating that you should be using your D&D table for therapeutic use. Um, a saying I often have is uh, D&D is not therapy. It's awesome if you notice that's therapeutic. But just be really careful about crossing the boundary um, and creating an awkward environment for your other friends um, by trying to address some real world wounds uh, through the game of D&D, especially if it's supposed to just be casual. Um, that, that can be so painful to to bring real life stuff into the, the game world. And then everybody else is kind of like held hostage by what's going on so therapeutic not therapy exactly but the reason i wanted to bring that up is because in establishing why D, &D can't has the potential to be a useful therapeutic tool um one of the things that she talks about is immersion and the chapter has like a bunch of different definitions um from a lot of different sources so i, I figured i'd pick some of the simpler ones and, and really just like you mentioned michael it is a nebulous term which can make it difficult to define. So she talks about eight aspects of immersion, which is actually based off of a of a I think a book by Sarah Lynn Bowman. Um, and the eight aspects of immersion are uh, flow, engagement, involvement, absorption, transportation, presence, engrossment, and disassociate or dissociation. Um, and a lot of times I find that where miscommunication over immersion happens is someone is talking about one aspect and the other person is talking about another. Um, and they just assume that they're operating with the same definition. So on the, on the run sheet, you have these bullets kind of listed down. Why don't we go through one by one real quick, the, the definition for, let's start with flow. Yeah. So flow was, uh, first coined by a positive psychologist, Mihai Cheek sent Mihai, and I practice that a lot so I can say it. Um, but really, it's defined as when a person is presented with challenges that they have the ability to overcome with the tools and skills that they already possess. And uh, Mihai Cheek sent Mihai argued that this is the happiest mindset that a human can be in. Um, so for a video game example, flow would be like a legend of zelda game where you go into the dungeon maybe you find an item or you just got a new item so you have the tool to overcome a challenge the first puzzle is relatively straightforward or it teaches you how to use the thing and then when you get to a deeper room in the dungeon uh the puzzles get more and more challenging but you're able to overcome them with the skills and tools you have or you're shown a puzzle that you don't have the tool yet you go into the dungeon, get the tool, and then return to the first room where now you can overcome it. So that is the idea of a flow state where there's yeah. like this graph between um, how much skill you have over time. So you brought up a video game example, but flow is talked about a lot in video games because you want to introduce challenges that you can't that you can overcome, but you're like learning to overcome. The wall isn't so high that it's insurmountable and then like uh, turns you off from that experience. But the wall isn't so low that you're like instantly figuring it out and breezing past it. Because I think that state of constant learn <coughs> learning, excuse me, is what keeps uh, keeps us engaged or one of the things that can keep us engaged. Uh, engagement. What's engagement? 
Um, so engagement is how invested one is in an activity, um, which is distinct from involvement, which is how you get involved in that activity. So um, like the distinction would be that there are several people that watch the critical role live play, but don't play D&D &D themselves. So that would be engagement. Whereas involvement would be how you actually go out to be to get your own D and D game. I'm very uh, invested in my characters, therefore, I mean that would file under engagement here, right? Uh, do you mean the characters that you're not playing? What? Uh, or do you <laughs> mean? Like, you? Sorry. Well, sometimes uh, yes, you yes, it is, but also creating... okay. <laughs> yeah. No, like if Quentin, for example, I played before it. Um, or copper, my my Kenku cleric, whatever it was. I'm very invested in their personas, their their stories, and that sort of thing. So that's the way that I engage uh, with with the game. But the involvement would be the the actual sitting down and playing. Is that okay? Right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, absorption? Yeah. Which is, so so we're, we're down to number four in the in the eight aspects of immersion, just to, to recap. So absorption is uh, just the altered state of consciousness that the individual enters. Um, throughout this book, uh, the author talks about the magic circle, which is basically when you sit down to play, you're almost entering a different mode of your life. And I think that this is what a lot of people think of when it comes to immersion is that you're not really worried about um, what you're going to have for dinner or going to the grocery store later. Like you're absorbed in, in almost a meditative state in the act of playing the game in front of you. Yeah. So that's um, when everybody on Stranger Things is sitting down in the, the basement, don't need to worry about their, their life uh, outside of it and everybody's just dressed up and, and having fun that could be being absorbed in that uh, that process uh, what about transportation transportation is how the narrative of the story or activity can mentally take one away from their current environment into a new one so again i i think that when a lot of people use the term immersion this is what they're talking about which is you're able to imagine the sensory input that your character is experiencing inside of a fictional world. Everywhere is usually from the perspective of like the DM is trying to immerse their players as if this is something that you can kind of like jam onto people by telling a long story and that sort of thing. Not everybody works that way. We'll talk a little bit about that. I guess presence might play into it. Present is how immersed someone is in the moment of the activity, um, which is also kind of like a mindful state. Um, so I know that, for example, I don't know if I'm throwing you under the bus, but like you kind of get annoyed if you're GMing and like players are talking about football on the side instead of, you know, paying attention to the game or on so, the phones or, or whatever. Right. So presence is like how mindful they are in the moment. And I feel like when we talk about immersion, this is something that you value a whole lot. And I do think that before we go on, just these things layer, obviously. So like you can be engaged and not involved and not thrown into the environment, but it's really hard to be involved and not engaged. Um, but I could also see if you're watching Critical Role, for example, you can be engaged, not involved, but also experience transportation where you can imagine the descriptions that uh, Matt Mercer is giving. So a lot of these are like interrelated, but they aren't necessarily mutually inclusive. Yeah, that makes sense. Engrossment. So this is defined as when the players of a game all agree upon the suspension of disbelief required to engage in the gaming world. Um, okay. Yeah, I almost wonder if this is where you like pick apart the game's logic. Yeah, I see like a lot of rules, lawyery stuff kind of coming into the the situation. Well, like like technically you can't do that because of the X, Y, and Z, whereas everybody else is kind of cool with it. Yeah, and then there's the the emotional thing. So suspension of disbelief is just that even if the things going on in the world are fantastical, they do follow either some sort of logic or you just are able to accept that it's possible within the frame of this story. Um, so, for example, uh, like the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy, if suddenly Doctor Strange and a whole bunch of aliens and magic were to show up in the universe he established, it wouldn't really thematically fit. The whole thing with the Dark Knight trilogy is that Batman is like a real person with real limitations. Um, and even though he's got fantastical gadgets, they all somehow follow real world physics. 
Whereas the longer the MCU goes on, the wilder <laughs> all of the physics gets. So it's not it's not grounded in the same way that the original Iron Man film was. Uh, uh, disassociation, that one I'm really good at. So yeah, it's it's this is why I keep, it's not disassociate. It's just dissociation. Oh, okay. I'm not sure how they're different. Dissociation is how one can temporarily feel detached from reality while engaged in the immersive activity. And I think this loops back to flow. This is where you're so engrossed that you don't uh, feel the passage of time. Um, but it's also it's it comes back to transportation where like this is where you feel cathartic real world emotions from the imaginary game that we're all playing. Those are the eight aspects of immersion. It's easy to to break apart and point out things where you might be breaking flow. You might be, you know, moving away from engagement. So for example, flow, like if you're constantly hitting your players with just overwhelmingly uh, challenging, insurmountable tasks, they will they're not able to drop in because there's there might be a little bit of learning involved to try to to overcome the the challenge but if the wall is too high again it kind of alienates the 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 players you know pushes them away from wanting to to learn more and actually invest themselves for engagement if they if they're not somebody who actually cares about their character then be engaging with uh, the game through that method might not be the one or one that they can like rely on or rather one that you as a GM might be able to rely on. So maybe they need to be engaged in a different way. Uh, as far as involvement, I think that one's pretty straightforward. But if you're constantly failing to actually play, then you will cultivate disinterest in wanting to to play again. Uh, the longer time you spend apart, the, the more likely that detachment is uh, about to happen. For absorption, if you have uh, a bunch of uh, this probably counts for presence as well but if you have a bunch of distraction in your your background or if you're like if you're not able to line up the tone of your game with like what's actually happening in the outside world you're you're going to fail at one or you know a few of these different um options so like it, for example if you're playing the wrong kind of music during combat it probably doesn't wrap your players in that experience that's a functional breakdown like, are you, are you failing to, to drop your players under flow or you're failing to engage them? Think about why. Uh, it could be due to other layers uh, on top of this, uh, these aspects of immersion. Yeah, just to reference the past episode we did, um, one of the reasons that expedience of play, I feel like, is one of the latest design trends that we're seeing out of new TTRPG systems is because there's a recognition that a lot of players are unable to reach flow because of how long turns take. So part of entering that state of flow is figuring out ways to remove the attack roll or remove the damage roll, remove steps in the process so it's easier for players to drop in. And you actually brought up a point earlier about transportation, which is a lot of GMs try to immerse their players, and so they try to force it with like long descriptions um, which can actually sometimes result in the opposite. Nothing takes me out of a game more than a GM going on and on and on about what color the curtains are, um, as opposed to just letting me start making decisions. So um, dissociation uh, and transportation and absorption, a lot of times are side effects of what you're doing, um, not things that you actively create for your players. So one of the things I used to say, um, and I think still holds up to an extent, is immersion is permission-based. So if you are trying to force your kind of immersion on a player that they don't want, then no matter how verbose your descriptions are, that's not going to guarantee that they get transported, right? They have to be in a state that allows them to be transported as opposed to having it activated. Um, there's a great quote that one of my mentors gave, which is great teachers don't overcome, they infiltrate in that a lot of times they create, they, they don't just say to do something and then you do it. They create an environment in which you're able to figure out and flourish on your own. I'll agree with all that. I'll also say that I'm the type of person who does like listening to and sharing deep explanations of things. Maybe not the colors of the drapes necessarily, but, and it can be difficult to find that balance between like I've certain players are just, they just blank out. 
Like if you, if you, you talk, they just want to do. And I, I think having those players at my table, that's a de- decision for me, like as, as a GM, like whether or not I'm willing to adjust the style that I feel comfortable with in order to facilitate the game that the players want. And at a lot of tables, you will have people who don't engage with the game the same way or have a GM who wants to run a different type of experience than the players are willing to to take on. Um, it's nice to talk about these things, but what do you do with them? What's the action you can take? One of the good questions is, uh, how do we achieve immersion? Um, and really, I, I found I, I've been successful in immersing my players through any of these by uh, paying attention to agreements, environment, and attention. Um, And what I mean by those is agreements is basically your session zero. It's the conversations leading up to the game about what the game's going to be about, what the tone is going to be like, how seriously we're going to take it. You know, this would be like if you are a clinician and you're using tabletop games as a therapeutic tool that would be an agreement that you would need to know up front is that this is going to be a therapeutic tool. So that changes kind of the frame of it. Environment is like the the physical space, how you construct it and the tools that you use or don't use. So like environment would be like what you said about the music, where music can help immerse a lot of players. Sometimes it's also distracting. I was playing a, a game at a family education center And there was Zumba going on in the room over. So there was like loud boop bop Zumba music and women going, ah, ha, ha. Um, So when the dungeon master kept trying to blare medieval fantasy combat music over the Zumba music, it just created overstimulation. It didn't help immerse us. But like what you said, which is what I call attention, which is you pay attention to what's actually immersing your players because some players don't want dissociation or transportation so even though a lot of game masters are like i really want to immerse my players they don't want that they just want to play the game with the dice and say i take the attack action other gamers want the long verbose descriptions they want to be immersed they want to be emotionally involved in the story and the mechanics are secondary to that and Part of it as the game master is you're trying to figure out what does each person at the table like? And again, what are you willing to compromise on and what are you not? Man, I love, I love Zumba. <laughs> Do you now? <laughs> yeah. We learn um, something new every day. You play online in a text-based format. Do you consider your players immersed? I consider them more immersed than any other format that I've ever tried to run. What? Yes. Uh, which I know is is very counterintuitive. Um, so in I, I'm gonna have to give it as a long story. I'm sorry. But so, basically real quick, yeah. I so immersed or or engaged as a part of immer- like immersion immersed as in transported dissociation absorption like they okay. can imagine everything going on much clearer than and they're more engaged and they care more and they remember better than any other type of game i've tried to run okay so i i can't do that because the interface so roll 20 in particular it's archaic that is for me distracting and also, I like to to speak. I like to hear what's going on. Um, when there's like an image on screen, that sometimes that's relevant. Sometimes you need to ignore it because it's not like actually on the scene at the moment. Sometimes it looks different than what's being described. All of these factors kind of pile on, and I I don't feel like I'm I'm there. I can still imagine the story. I still uh, still like reading the details and and that sort of thing. But I. I don't consider myself immersed. In fact, I'm more likely to to like you know disengage or be on my phone or go get a drink or, or whatever by virtue of the environment that um, that I'm playing on. You know, being a, a VTT, so I'm, I'm definitely the type of person who likes in person experiences more, which you know we've we've talked about uh, a lot in the past. So that 
I think is a, a factor that we haven't really talked about. Um, just the the vehicle for play is going to uh, influence how your your players are immersed as well. Right from when I started playing D and D, one of the things I noticed, uh, just paying attention to the players, my fellow players around the table, is how often they would forget details. So they wouldn't remember, you know, Aragoth, the dwarven blacksmith. They'd be like the beard guy at the forge, right? Like it would be this very surface level knowledge of what was happening in the campaign. Um, it, and, and a lot of times they would even forget continuity of what would happen. And also sometimes the DM would forget continuity of what would happen. So one of the things I thought early on is how cool, first of all, would it be for them to remember? And second of all, this sounds like a book, like any fantasy series someone would like to read. How cool would it be if it could somehow get chronicled? Um, one DM uh, recorded their sessions so that they could listen back and take notes uh, to make sure that continuity was upheld. And that was a major time investment um, and a very slow process. And oftentimes they wouldn't be able to listen back to the recording, take notes and keep continuity before the next session happened. Fast forward to 2020, pandemic happens and we all go into quarantine the one of the dm says hey let's try roll 20 you know we'll do uh discord for our video and voice and we'll just use the roll 20 for maps and everything it, honestly it was a disaster i i've never i i it was the worst D D i've ever played and largely it had to do with player behavior like players interrupting each other um there are also technical issues like a lot of like about half our players had devices that weren't fast enough to just run Discord. So there are these constant lost connections, uh, constant technical failures, mics that sounded like a McDonald's drive through So what I noticed in Roll20 is that there was a chat window. So instead, uh, one of uh, a DM we both know, Ian um, from Incendium RPGs, when he started DMing, what he would do is he'd type his like scene description into chat and then narrate it. And what I noticed is for me, being able to read it actually just engaged my brain in a different way. And I was more immersed reading it than I was listening to it, especially since there were so many technical issues of dropped internet connections and, and poor technology. So what I did is, is you were there from the first game where I'm like, hey, type your descriptions into chat. The problem was I didn't tell anyone ahead of time I was trying this and I got immediate pushback. And we started doing this hybrid thing where like some people would type, some people would talk out loud. But as the DM, I would often miss one or the other because I was trying to pay attention to both channels of communication. I, you know, I stopped that campaign. I ended it. For the next campaign, I said, listen, you can role play out loud, but if it doesn't happen in the chat window, like you don't type it in, then it basically, I'm going to count it as it didn't happen. Um, and the reason for that was merely for people who dropped their internet connection when they logged back on, they wouldn't miss anything. Cause I've had a lot of experiences where I get up, I go to use the bathroom. I come back, I say, what just happened? Somebody gives me a brief description, but misses some key details. So like three sessions later I'm role playing and they're like, that never happened. Or you can't role play like that because of this other detail. But I, I was trying to just juggle what had happened in the few seconds I was gone to leave the bathroom. So, um, so because of that record, what my players started to notice is that they they were just engaging like I was, just a lot better. They were able to visualize it from a visual medium. And what I started doing is I would take the chat logs from Roll20 and I would edit them into a short story that the players could read after. So rather than just having the experience getting up and going away, what they would do is they would have the experience, you know, maybe it was better than in person, maybe not. But because they got to experience the game in an edited, structured format afterwards, they started like really engaging with it much better. So instead of just, hey, our boss at the Adventurers Guild, it was Brogmir the Minotaur, my friend at the Swift Guard headquarters. So it just because they were able to engage with it more than just live at the table, uh, they just started enjoying it a lot more because it's it's enjoyable to experience to commit to something that you can remember i could see that and knowing your players i could see that 
one question should or that we should probably should answer is uh do we even care about uh about immersion like is that a thing that actually needs to exist megan a connell in her book referenced a study called shared fantasy by gary allen fine where he talked about three frames um and you have the frame of the player the frame of the system and the frame of the character so frame of the character is where you're imagining yourself from your character's perspective it's the classic what would my character would do the system is just the mechanics and then the person is just you as an individual so the example she gives is like my character swings their axe with a battle cry uh i roll 1d8 plus 3 damage 5 damage total can you pass the chips like you're moving through all three frames um if you're defining immersion as how much you're in the frame of the character, I would argue no. Um, I think there needs to be at least some engagement with the system in that like you're like, this is a D8 and I'm going to roll it. Um, and obviously we shouldn't lose sight of the frame of the person. Um, one of the things I love about the new 5th edition player's handbook uh, is that it says, what would your character do? And it says, you know, don't metagame, think in terms of your character, unless it's going to um, ruin the fun of other players at the table. So we should be cognizant of the real world people that we're playing with as well. Um, but I think in terms of immersion, really, uh, it, if you're defining it as engagement and involvement, probably it's necessary to have fun. Um, if you're defining it as like engrossment or transportation or absorption probably not all right well if this video has been interesting helpful or entertaining please feel free to like subscribe tell your friends about the channel and uh we'll catch you next time <laughs>